Hi everyone, welcome. Uh, today we will talk about microbiology in astrobiology and I am Zeynep uh, from Turkey. And now I will share my screen and start my presentation. And... Okay. I hope you can see my screen. Okay, uh, my group uh, name is MicroAstro and we are three people. I'm Zeynep and my group mates are Ryan and Mehdi. And today, today's outline for me will be a definition of microbiology and definition of astral microbiology and types of microbes and my project in uh, Blue Marble Space, uh, Blue Marble Space. <laughs> I'm sorry, and uh, B M S I S. I'm always saying like that. That's why I cannot say the oh, long way. Okay, um, I'm starting. Uh, microbiology is um, coming from two words. Uh, one is biology, and it's derived from the Greek words bios, that means life, and also logos, that means study. So. Um, also, micro means uh, small, so it's the study of small living things. And this includes bacteria, archaea, viruses, fungi, prions, protozoa, and algae. So commonly, that um, they are called as microbes. And we will see some um, scientists here. They study for microbes. Here, Leeuwenhoek, he dis uh, discovered the microscope. And Edward Jenner, he uh, discovered the vaccine against smallpox. And Alexander Fleming, he discovered penicillin. And Louis Pasteur, I am sure you know the name. He uh, developed first rabies vaccine, and also he named the pasteurization. This process is killing the pathogenic bacteria in the foods uh, such as milk. And Robert Koch uh, is very, very famous guy in microbiology. He always uh, called, he's always called like uh, the father of microbiology. And he uh, established a causative relationship between a microbe and a disease. And Barry Marshall, uh, he also identified the link between Helicobacter pylori infection and stomach ulcers. And Zurhausen uh, also uh, find a link between uh, papilloma virus and cervical cancer. And now we have a, a short video about microorganisms. Smile and learn. Do you know what microorganisms are and how many types of them are there? Let's learn everything about them. There are organisms that consist of one single cell, called unicellular organisms. These organisms are very small. That's why we call them microorganisms. You may also know them by other names like germs or microbes. To observe microorganisms, we need specific instruments like microscopes. Microorganisms come in many sizes and forms. In ancient times, some investigators had already questioned whether or not the diseases human beings had may be caused by organisms invisible in plain sight. This is when they started investigating microorganisms. Anton von Leeuwenhoek was the first investigator to start observing microorganisms in the 17th century. Microscopes and the investigations done with them allowed other scientists to continue learning how diseases were caused or how they could be cured. Some types of microorganisms are bacteria, viruses, and fungi. Bacteria. They are prokaryotic cells. They have no nucleus. Some bacteria are useful in food fermentation, like making yogurt or cheese. By contrast, other bacteria are harmful and may cause infections. We treat bacteria with antibiotics. They spread in different ways. 
viruses. They are not living beings. To carry out the vital functions, they need a host, that is, a living being. They are much smaller than bacteria. Sometimes they can infect them and live inside them. Some viruses cause diseases like flu or chickenpox. To prevent diseases caused by viruses, vaccination is important. There isn't a vaccine for every virus. Fungi. Some fungi are microorganisms bigger than bacteria or viruses. They can be found in the air, plants, or in the water. Some, like yeasts, are used to make foods. I'm sure you've seen mold on fruit or bread. This is a type of fungi. As we have seen, microorganisms can be everywhere because they are not visible in plain sight. To prevent diseases and avoid getting infected, it is very important to have good hygiene habits. Now you're all an expert in microorganisms. You know how to tell the difference among bacteria, viruses, and fungi. See you around! Oh, I'm sorry. And now, uh, I have some uh, questions for you. And let's go and check this Padlet. I will copy and paste this to chat here. Oh, no. Everyone, okay. And let's go there and see what I asked. Okay, now I'm asking you to write the names of these microbes. And here I gave some tips for words. Which one is bacteria? Which one is fungi? Which one is viruses? Which one is algae? Let's uh, try to guess them. I will wait your comments and then I will write the right names, okay? Yeah, that's right. Wow, that's good. What is that? No. <laughs> yeah, you're right. This is bacteria. Let's give this the name, bacteria. And what about this? Just one answer came. Any more guess? Ah, I can see. Yeah. Wow, you are really good on that. Okay, you are right. This is virus. And yeah, that's the right answer also. This is fungi. And these are also an uh, right answer, protozoa. But this is not uh, right. I will wait a little bit more for your answers and then I will write these. Mm. Yeah, Archaea. This is Archaea. And this is algae. And this is Brian. And let's go back our presentation. Oh. Let's come. Um, talk about uh, astromicrobiology. Astromicrobiology uh, is a study of microorganisms in, in space. 
Uh, for example, my project Salad is uh, also dealing with some microorganisms and I will talk about that later. But I'm asking you, uh, can microorganisms survive in space conditions? What do you think about this? I'm waiting your answers in the chat part. Yes, and why? Why do you think like that? You learn uh, origins of life and life conditions uh, from the uh, previous lectures. So, yeah. But then why we cannot find any microorganisms in space? Why we are still searching but cannot find? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, tardigrades are survival in the moon. But we are not also sure about it. Okay, these are good answers, but uh, also scientists are not, um, scientists also cannot be sure about these questions answers. So I just uh, ask you open-ended questions. So I'm just, um, I was just curious about your ideas. Okay, now let's uh, talk about a little bit more types of uh, microbes. Uh, bacteria, I'm sure you know these type of uh, microbes. Bacteria are single-celled microbes and their size structure is simpler than the other uh, microorganisms. And they don't have a nucleus or membrane-bound organelles. And you can see in this picture some of them, uh, some of their structure and shapes. Also, they live in everywhere, totally in everywhere, uh, in every habitat on Earth, like soil, uh, rocks, and uh, even Arctic uh, snow. You can see in in the ice. So some live in uh, even inside the other organisms, uh, some like plants or animals, and also they live in and on humans. For example. Uh, our skin has so many type of bacteria and there are approximately 10 times as many bacteria cells as human cells. Um, a lot of these bacterial cells are found um, lining in the uh, digestive systems, but some bacteria live in the um, soil or dead plant matter also. Sometimes some types of bacteria can cause food spoilage and also um, some can be parasitic for us. So we should be careful about eating <laughs> food and also washing hands, etc. Always try to be clean. And here I have a game for you. And I will copy this link and let's play together, okay? <laughs> we are more bacteria than human. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, to everyone, okay. I want you to join me for this game, okay? I will follow the chat from here. And when you click, Yeah, it's million and million, actually billion. <laughs> and here we will see a little bit of them in cafeteria where they can be or in our body where they can be. And we will answer some questions and we will find this uh, word. Okay, I'm clicking play and I hope 
you are doing that also. And we will uh, click the stars, find the stars, and then we will uh, answer the question when uh, it's asking. For example, this. Every time you take a breath, you are inhaling billions of microbes that are floating in the air. Do these bacteria help people? I want your answers, yes or no. Mm -hmm. Two different answers. Okay, two yes, one no. Three yes, one no. Okay, any more answer? Okay, I'm going for yes. Yeah, you are right. Microbes are floating uh, in the air generally, do not affect us. And, and they are rare that they will make you sick and microbes have make, helps make the oxygen that uh, we breathe. So we find a letter here. And now second star, this guy came out of the bathroom. He might have picked up microbes in there. Do these bacteria help people? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> okay, I'm going for going with <laughs> first no. <laughs> yeah, you are right. Microbes you pick up in the bathroom can be harmful. So he's scrubbing up for, before uh, chowing down. So let's find another star here. This boy or girl. Okay. Oh, oh, our soccer team had a great game, but her knees got all scraped up. Microbes could. Uh, could get into her body. Do these bacteria help people? No. Yeah. No. Okay. This is also right answer. Good thing she has cleaned and bandaged her knees. That way, harmful microbes can get into her body and uh, cause an infection. So we have three letters now. We are good, we are going very good. Okay, let's check this uh, cookman. Raw meat can be loaded with bacteria like salmonella that could make you sick. Do these bacteria help people? No. <laughs> no. Yeah. Okay, you are right. Good thing this burger is being cooked. Otherwise, he would be serving a bacteria burger. So. We are close to answer now for our first word. Here we have a star also. Some kinds of microbes clean up the environment by um, gobbling up chemical waste. Do these bacteria help people? Yeah, they are helping us. They, these microbes it are, are oceans of uh, harmful things like oil spills. And here we have another star, yogurt. Yogurt is a fermented food made by billions of live bacteria. Do these bacteria help people? Yeah, but well, don't say the answer. <laughs> yeah, uh, microbes could make something so yummy and healthy. People uh, also use bacteria to help make other foods like cheese, chocolate, and sort of bread. Another star. I know you solved it, but I want you to see the all questions here to answer. If he doesn't brush and floss, the bacteria in his mouth will cause plaque. Uh, not to mention stinky bread. Do these bacteria have people? No. Yeah, you are. Very, very good in this game. It blocks saliva and allows uh, bacteria to make holes in your teeth called cavities. So they are not helping us. And here, another star. 
She can drink all she wants because the sucrose water has been specially treated with chlorine. Chlorine kills certain kinds of microbes. Do these bacteria help people? Okay, one yes, one no, two no, three no. So I'm going with no. Yeah, you are right. Water has lots of microbes in it. That's why we are cleaning with chlorine. So they're not uh, helping us, they're harmful. They can carry disease. And so before we drink, we should always uh, clean the water. And here another star, bacteria in the soil, break down that twigs and leaves and help this flower bloom. Do this bacteria help people? Yeah. Yes, okay, I'm going with yes. These microbes recycle everything that dies to make soil and replenish nutrients so that new plants can grow. Actually, my salad project is dealing with some kind of this area. And here, toast your banana peels in here. These microbes break down organic waste and turn, in, turn it into compost. Do this bacteria help people? Also it's same type of bacteria. Yeah. So we have two, two more star. I cannot see them. Where are they? Oh, here one. Fruits are full of fiber, a tasty trait for the bacteria that live in your gut. Do these bacteria help people? Yeah, just one answer came. Okay, yes. Yeah, they are helping us. <laughs> because uh, you are eating for trillions and the food you eat feed different kinds of good microbes. Uh, fibrous, uh, fibrous foods like fruits, vegetables, and whole grains will uh, nurture the bacteria that keep us healthy. So last question, where are you? I cannot see the star. Oh, okay, here. It takes real good to live in here. The bacteria in your intestines are busy digesting foods and producing useful nutrients. Do these bacteria help people? Yeah, they're helping us. So you already solved the question, but <laughs> you are really good in this game. Okay, I'm going to make my presentation and now we will start with viruses. Viruses, they are also everywhere. Some don't infect humans, uh, but some uh, such as common cold cause minor irritating symptoms. Viruses are the smallest of uh, all of the microbes and they are unique because uh, they are only alive and they have a host cell. I mean, when can, uh, they can be alive and they find a live, uh, living thing. So uh, they have a machinery for, uh, to make new um, viruses, their only purpose to live is that. And if every virus on Earth were lined, uh, lined up end to end, that line would extend uh, 100 million light years. And that means they can go out, uh, go out of our galaxy because our galaxy is 1 million light years. And what do you think about them? Can viruses survive in space? Uh, and also scientists are searching space for extraterrestrial viruses. And why do you think they are doing that? And also, do you know what is astrovirology? Yeah, that was really fun. I'm thanking you to joining that game with me. Actually, uh, scientists are supposing viruses can survive in space or they are already living there, maybe some kind of them. Because, uh, you know, I mentioned that they are not alive. So in there, they can stay 
and wait for a living host cell. And also, uh, maybe in the future, we can have some space type viruses. I am hoping to not have them, but I hope to see these days also not getting <laughs> viruses like harmful, but to find a virus there. Okay, uh, I have a, vi a video for um, viruses, how they are coming and attaching to uh, cells and also how they are producing in the cells. I will show it on YouTube, sorry. Oh, I will make it a little bit fast because it's so slow. Okay. We don't know that questions answered because we, <laughs> we have not seen that, but that's a really great question. Yeah, maybe they are virus, but they are uh, not viral to us. Contact. Uh, I think we cannot. See. This is the moment when infection begins. How does infection happen? You see the tiny shapes there on the virus particle's surface? They seem like random blobs. In reality, they are tiny keys, proteins that have evolved to the perfect shape and size, enabling them to unlock these receptors on the surface of this lung cell. Like a smile and a handshake, the virus deceives this lung cell and is welcomed in, where it will command the cell to make more virus particles. So now, our virus entered the cell and now it will reproduce itself. And I'm sorry, but I need to do it same. Okay, it's like... Every cell in your body is a tiny factory, constantly making proteins. Your genetic code, or DNA, directs every activity. Protein-making machinery in the cell reads the cell's own DNA and makes sure the cell proteins go where they're needed. Viruses have their own genetic code, but they don't have the machinery to copy their DNA. So viruses need your cell's machinery to reproduce themselves. A virus starts this process by using the keys on its surface to gain entry. Like a Trojan horse, it enters the cell. The virus releases its own DNA into the unsuspecting cell and hijacks the protein-making machinery. Now, this vital cell function becomes an assembly line for new virus particles. No longer in Actually, service to the, body, are the, the cell now serves the virus, microbes. manufacturing and thousands of new virus particles, which are released to enslave more cells, thousands and thousands more. Because they are reproducing themselves so fast, and they are using your things uh, to reproduce themselves. So they are coming and uh, changing your... Uh, cell types so they are using your ribosomes and uh, they are using your reproducing things they are using um, your cells to make more and more viruses so they need you but then they will become more and more more so like uh, covid pandemic it's so dangerous to have them i i hope to not see a, spy, a space virus as harmful parasitic so time for a break <laughs> Uh, I'm giving you three minutes, then we will continue with uh, fungi. Okay, see you.
I'm back. Hello, everyone, again. Now we will continue with um, fungi. Um, fungi can be single celled or really complex multicellular organisms. They are very cute, but not always. They are sometimes harmful, but just some, some kind of them. They are found in every habitat and also they are mostly living in, on the land or in the soil and also they are living in the uh, plant material and also they are sometimes decomposers. And see their structure. They have, uh, some of them have mushrooms. These are macroscopic uh, filamentous fungi and this is fruiting body and this is uh, carrying some spores to reproduce. And these are hyphae. These are strands and uh, they are coming together and networking and making a mycelium. These are helping to get uh, nutrients from soil and also these are attaching to plants. So uh, many will talk about that later. And here we have some kind of uh, petri arts. These are coming in made from bacteria, but they also using, they are also using yeasts and some kind of um, fungi. Um, oh, this. Let's go to that link and also I will copy this to chat. You can go with me. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm really exciting these type of uh, arts. Sometimes scientists are making fun with those. <laughs> See, these are real petries, but we are being in the lab. <laughs> Um, some kind of yeasts here and also here, some kind of um, micro, uh, microscopic, microscopic filamentous uh, hyphae type fungi. And these are a mycelium shape. So in the petri, you can see this networking. And if you want to check this type of petries, you can just search on Google and find more. And here we have a short video about fungi. It will uh, also talk about the details of fungi. Smile and learn. Today we're going to learn everything about fungi. Which of these organisms would you say is a fungus? All of them are fungi. Let's learn more about these organisms. The fungal kingdom, also called fungi kingdom, is one of the five kingdoms into which all living things are divided. Note that fungi are not animals or plants. Fungi are living organisms because they carry out the vital functions of interaction reproduction, and nutrition by themselves. Some fungi, like yeasts, are unicellular microorganisms not visible in plain sight. To observe them, we need to use a microscope. Other fungi are multicellular. These are composed of many cells, grouped together, forming long, thin strings called hyphas. Hyphas form the reproductive structures. The mushrooms, or the mold, contain spores by which fungi reproduce. We usually find fungi under the ground, on pieces of wood, or on decayed food.
Fungi are formed by one or many eukaryotic cells. Fungi eukaryotic cells are enveloped by a cellular wall and contain no chlorophyll. Remember, they're not animals or plants. Fungi cell groupings don't form tissues, as in the case of animals. They form hyphas. Some fungi are edible and very tasty, like mushrooms or truffles. Careful, some can be toxic. There are other foods, like some types of cheeses, that have fungi in them. Roquefort cheese, for example. There are some fungi harmful to our health that may cause skin or lung diseases. Some fungi produce antibiotic substances used as medicines to fight bacterial infections. One of the most well-known and widely used antibiotics is penicillin. This antibiotic was discovered by Alexander Fleming in the 20th century. Fungi can be found in the air, plants, or in water, and they are mainly transmitted through contact. Poor hygiene or poor sanitizing may be the reason why people get infected by fungi. In nature, mushrooms produce spores that travel in the air until they reach a place where they can germinate. Fungi are heterotrophs, meaning they feed on other living beings. That's why many fungi are decomposers. For example, some types of molds decompose fruits and vegetables to be able to feed themselves and grow. The substances they decompose are also sources of soil nutrients that plants and other living beings feed on. As you can see, fungi are very important for human beings and the planet. Thanks to them, we can make foods and medicines to cure diseases. They are also necessary for the vital processes in many biomes, as they're able to decompose organic material. That's all about fungi. Interesting, right? Yeah, now. Um, also, I will mention that yeasts are uh, the most widely used model organism for genetics uh, studies, for example, especially the cancer research. And also some kind of yeast uh, can be opportunistic pathogenics for our body. And that means they are not harming normally, but when your immune system is down, I mean, when you are not healthy, or for example, when a virus uh, came and make uh, a healthy immunity for you, uh, unhealthy immunity for you, for example, when you are cold, they can uh, use that opportunity to become a, a pathogen. So we should be also careful about fungi. And now we will uh, continue with uh, protozoa. They are really, really tiny, uh, small organisms. They are also single-celled and they have many uh, types of shapes and size. Uh, most known uh, type of them are Amoeba and Paramecium and Euglena. Um, they, they live mostly in um, soil and water, uh, for example, mobs. And some are parasitic. Uh, for example, uh, Plasmodium uh, can cause uh, malaria. And also, uh, they are moving uh, with uh, some kind of uh, structures like cilia here. This is um, some kind of hairy things. And this Euglena has flagella. And also, Amoeba has um, a type of movement uh, com name coming from his, um, its name. This type of uh, structures are helping its moment and we have also a short video about them oh i'm sorry in the first instance we tend to answer mosquito but that is not entirely right malaria is not caused by the mosquito it is only transmitted by this vector malaria is caused by the organisms belonging to the genus plasmodium 
And what are these organisms? Well, they fall in the next category of microbes that we will be learning in this video. The third category of microorganisms, these are called the protozoa. As the name suggests, proto stands for primitive, while zoan means animal. Wait a second, are we saying these are organisms primitive to animals? Yes, they are unicellular in nature. However, the single cell has highly complex functions. Hence, they are also referred to as the pinnacle of unicellular complexity. So what do you think will be their structure? Well, they have a typical eukaryotic cell structure. Does the nucleus and the membrane-bound organelles form an integral part of the cell? Many of them possess food vacuoles which are used to store food. And these cells do not have a cell wall. Are there any more special features? Many of them have additional features like cilia or flagellum for locomotion. Cilia are these tiny hair-like structures which are present throughout the body. Flagellum, on the other hand, is usually a slender long filament which is single or rarely multiple in number. Now this was their structure. What could be their nutrition type? Here we are referring to whether they are autotrophic, that is self-nourishing, or heterotrophic, meaning they cannot prepare their own food. We know that these cells are like animal cells and have mobility. So do you think they will be autotrophic like plants? Of course not. These are heterotrophic in nature. Yes, they are dependent on other organisms as their food source. Only a few rare exceptions include the chlorophyll containing euglena. It usually performs photosynthesis, but others lack the capacity to do so. Many organisms belonging to the protozoan group are well-known parasites. They derive nutrition directly from the body of living organisms. So they do not kill the host, but do harm them severely. A few commonly known examples of protozoans include amoeba, euglena, paramecium, and the disease-causing plasmodium. This was about the third category, that is the protozoa. Okay. And now I have a short video about their movement and I will make it fast because it's so much slow. And you will see how protozoa look, looks like under the microscope. And this is uh, 300X and it's just uh, moving. And you will see now in another um, type of lens and they will attach each other. Here, they will conjugate here, how they are moving. And I will make it a little bit more faster because it's just showing their movement. And it's detailed view, more and more closer, how they are moving. You are looking them under the microscope. See, these are cilia, and it's using to take nutrients with, with the help of them. See, here we have another unidentified microorganism. So, look at that uh, closely, and I have a question for you for that. If you want to name the last unidentified microorganism, what will be the names of it? So I will copy this to write your comments. And I'm waiting for your responses in here. Oh, I cannot go. Okay. I'm waiting for your responses here. I will see your answers. Microzoa, Ariha, 
Hmm. Mikrosa, I like this name. So feel free to answer that question and I will be watching your response later and I will share this uh, with you later. And let's go with Aldea. Uh, they are mostly green. They have uh, chloroplasts like plants and you can see them on the sea, on the oceans and they can exist as single cells, but also um, you can see them in different colors because of uh, pigments of chlorophyll. Um, also, planktons are uh, in here. They can make some kind of um, community like that. Uh, we can observe them under the uh, microscope like this. And I will give a break for you uh, just three minutes and I will continue with um, some type of games and I have a puzzle for you. Then uh, Mehdi and Ryan will continue with their lecture, okay? Mm, I'm stopping to share.
Okay, I came back and sharing my screen again. Now we will continue with Archaea. Archaea are, um, Archaea name is coming from Greek word, Archaos. Uh, that means ancient or primitive. So they are primitive structure of organisms and they have many types of shapes and they were classified under bacteria. Uh, then uh, the scientists um, identified them as um, different kind of kingdom. So they are similar to bacteria, but they have some differences. Um, they can live in extreme environments, uh, in high pressures, high concentration of them or high temperatures. So uh, they are called as extremophiles. And that's why we are looking for a, um, a life in the space. So if we find an uh, organism in space, I'm sure it will be archaea. So we also find that. Um, and I have talked about differences. So these are a little bit more so much information. I'm just saying that archaea are extremophiles can survive in very high temperatures, but bacteria cannot. Um, and also they have so much um, similarities. They are very, very small and they are both autotrophs and heterotrophs. And also prions. Prions are some type of protein and they can cause disease in animals and humans uh, by triggering normal uh, healthy proteins in the brain to fold abnormally. Um, also now I will talk about my project in uh, Blue Marvel Space Institute of Science. Um, here, we can see a tomatoes. Here we can see a pepper. Here we can see some kind of uh, yeah, <laughs> green thing. I don't know what it is. This is chickpea and this is also another green plant. Uh, what we are doing, we, um, we are using lunar uh, soil and also Martian soil to grow them. And they're growing. These are the results I'm showing you. And um, for um, growing them, we are also using some special recipe uh, consisting of microorganisms. We are calling it as gelat a gelatinous cube. It has some nutrients, special nutrients, and also mostly microorganisms. These uh, soils have um, uh, same conditions as lunar soil and also uh, Martian soil. So we have good results. For example, this root and this root. This root is coming uh, from earth soil and this root is coming from uh, lunar soil. So they are so similar, so we can grow them. And in future, maybe we can <laughs> grow a potato like Martian game, a Martian movie. I hope we can see those days. I will uh, skip this video because it's same for the first one. And I have a uh, crosswords for you. Let's um, I will open chat. Okay. Now I'm waiting for your answers for this crosswords. <laughs> um, let's start with first uh, down include a uh, glana, parmesium, and amobia. What's that? That's the name of this type of microbes. A uh, glana, parmesium, and amobia. No one knows? Okay, I will start with the first one. Oh, okay. <laughs> it came. Yeah, protozoa. That's right. Yeah. And let's go with the second noun. Uh, this type of microbes have a high fat. And also one more tip for that. These have also edible mushrooms. What's that? Yeah, fungi, you're right. Okay, third the down one, disease cause proteins. 
these are just proteins and changing our proteins and causing disease. <laughs> <He's> like, <laughs> no, I mentioned that so less in one sentence at the last part. What are they? They are mostly found in brain. Prions, yeah, you are right, Ryan. And fourth, uh, single set microbes. These are just single set microbes. <laughs> but it's a good <laughs> word, I think. Yeah, bacteria, you are right. And let's go for the six uh, similar plants. They are similar to plants and they are mostly green, but also, oh, why I cannot see, on, okay. They are, includes also plankton. I'm sorry, I showed the answers so fast, but then I go back. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, Algea, you are right, Vicky. And also let's go for the across ones. Five, uh, study of viruses in space. What do you think about it? Astrovirology, yeah, you are right. And seventh one. They are not alive and they need a host cell. What are they? Viruses, yeah. And the last one, they live in extreme conditions. What are they? Yeah, <laughs> extremophiles are the special type of them, but the common name and uh, for their area is archaea. Yeah, you are right. We answered all of them. And thank you for listening. If you have any questions, I'm uh, happy to answer them. And now we will continue with Ryan and Maddie's part. And also I have a homework for you, but I will mention it at the end of the class. I have an experiment for you. I will give a guide for that. Okay, see you. All right, and feel free, obviously, ask any questions that you guys have, um, whether they're about uh, Zainab's uh, fantastic presentation or about mine uh, while I start. So I'll go ahead and share my screen real quick. All right, so to continue on from um, that uh, presentation on uh, an overview of microbiology and uh, certain types of microbes, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and talk about some of our ways of finding microbial life in space. Um, a little bit about me, uh, my name is Ryan and my background is uh, uh, more so in astronomy than um, biology, which is uh, part of why I chose to kind of structure my talk around that. Uh, right now, I'm currently a, a scientific communication research associate at Blue Marble. I'm also a communications intern for a NASA project called Braille, which you'll hear a lot about during this talk. Um, and I'm a supplemental instructor for astronomy courses nearby. All right, and so I want to start with this little Padlet, um, which we can just spend a few minutes doing real quick. I'll post it in the chat. Um, so everyone can uh, either 
take a, um, a scan of this QR code with your phone um, or just click on the link and participate that way. And um, we'll take a look and just let us know in that Padlet some of, uh, some of the ways that you think we can find microbes in space or what we can use to find them or even where we can find them in space or in our solar system. I won't spy while everyone's typing. I'll give everyone a minute there. I like the color changing there, that's awesome. Um, yeah, and so some of the, one of the common themes here real quick is um, that we can already see is, is samples. So samples are a huge way that we can try to find microbes in space. Um, although obviously uh, there's some challenges getting our samples back to Earth. Um, and yeah, so uh, a lot of people put down here that microscopes can be used or um, powerful telescopes or thermal imaging. Um, and so that's some great stuff. And I think we'll head back to that at the end. So feel free, continue to um, contribute to that. And we will take another look at the end and see um, if everyone still agrees with what they wrote, so. So next up, um, where do we think that we can find microbes in space? So in the Padlet, a lot of people wrote down um, different ways that we can look for them. And so, does anyone have any ideas on where we can find them? You can put them in the chat, or um, you should be able to unmute yourself and talk. Um, I feel like um, we can find microbes in areas in our solar system, with, depending if they don't want to be found or something like that. They could be most likely extremophiles, meaning they're in either hot planets or places that are very cold, anything that has extreme environment. Yeah, so we can look for extremophiles in hot and cold places. That's a great, um, a great country, uh, a great option here, hot and cold places. Um, huge because uh, a lot of our solar system is, is not very well regulated with heat. So there's a lot of really hot and a lot of really cold places. Other planets, that's another really good one. We'll put that down here too. Planets similar to Earth. And maybe just like one more idea here and then, um, and maybe on an asteroid, that's a great one too. Yeah, so those are some really great options on where we can look for um, microbial life. And so um, these are all great options and uh, maybe moons and um, exoplanets and exomoons uh, is another one that people are saying. So, and that's a great um, option. Specifically, we'd be looking at moons in our solar system um, since we're looking in our solar system. And here's some of the ones that, I'm just gonna go ahead and show some of the ones that I thought of beforehand. Um, uh, and so these are kind of, semi-specific examples. So does anyone know what that planet is? This is a huge hot topic in, um, uh, in the hunt for microbial life right now. Uh, not quite Jupiter. It's quite a bit smaller than Jupiter. Um, it's also a little bit closer. Yeah, it looks like Mars with ice. And that's exactly what it is. It is Mars. Um, and Mars has these kind of uh, amazing looking uh, polar ice caps. And then next up, here's another one that I brainstormed. And so this is actually a moon um, of Jupiter. Someone mentioned Jupiter earlier. This is one of Jupiter's moons. Um, and we expect that it has a huge amount of water underneath its icy layer. Do you guys know which moon this is? Uh, 
Europa. Yeah, exactly. It is Europa. That's a great one. Um, Europa is another huge, uh, you know, hot topic in astrobiology. The next one I've got here is this uh, kind of almost fuzzy looking planet. Um, anyone know what this planet is? It, it might not look super familiar yet. You might be more familiar with um, this picture here, with us trying to look beyond its its dense atmosphere. And this is a um, topological map trying to look at uh, the height and depth of certain features on it. Yeah, it does look. It, it's a very satisfying image, um, especially that one of just the atmosphere. It, it looks very smooth and um, looks very interesting. Yeah, it's Venus. Exactly. And so the last place that I put down here is maybe one that most people wouldn't be thinking of to look for microbial life. Um, and this is the International Space Station. And so a big part of hunting for microbial life is uh, comes down to us. Uh, we, we put life into space. And so uh, we need to be very cautious of that when it comes to looking for natural microbes. So NASA has this, uh, this project going called planetary protection. Um, and part of this is looking at what's called cross-contamination. So sending microbes to other planets, other potential ecosystems, um, and to make sure that we try to protect other ecosystems that might be out there. We try really hard to sanitize and wipe down everything um, with very special uh, sanitizers and equipment. Uh, when we do this, we have a similar problem to problems that we've all seen in the past year probably of uh, the same issue that hand sanitizer has where it only gets rid of, down at the bottom here, it only gets rid of 99.99% of germs. And we have this problem when it comes to, to trying to clean off our space equipment too. Um, we can't possibly try to get rid of all of the different microbial life that lives there. And so one of the reasons why that's a problem is because we want, we want to try to be careful of different types of contamination. So why should we care about this contamination though? Um, and there's two types of contamination. Forward cross-contamination is us sending microbial life into space. And why would we want to care about that? Uh, you might be thinking that it's not a big deal, or you might be thinking that it's a huge deal. And so what are some reasons why we might care about accidentally sending microbial life onto Mars or Europa, or even just into orbit? They're undefeatable, yeah. So that's a good way to word it. I like that. Um, so we have to be careful because uh, they could potentially thrive in certain ecosystems and be kind of undefeatable. And if that happens, um, we could potentially unleash a wave of microbial life where, where we wouldn't have expected it. Yes, and this is a really good example, is um, we could get false positives or false alarms when we're looking for life later on. So we could you know, be looking for life on Mars and we could find earth, uh, earth bred bacteria that we found there in accident because we sent it there in accident. And so uh, if we're looking for natural bacteria or natural microbes, um, we have to be careful that we can make sure we're not contaminating too many things and, and all that we're finding is our own um, contamination. And those are two really good examples. Um, and yeah, um, we have no idea what could happen. So we have to be pretty cautious. And the other thing that we have to be cautious about is um, backwards cross-contamination. So one of the things in the Padlet that people already put is we want to try to send samples back to Earth. And that's true, we would love to have samples. But one thing that we have to be careful of is this backwards cross-contamination, which is kind of introducing new and unique life, microbial life 
from space that could be out there back to Earth. So if we send a sample back, what if that microbe would thrive here? What would happen, right? And so why should we be cautious about that? Yeah, so there's, there could be some psychological um, effects here, um, not just with not being alone, but also some psychological effects. Um, and those psychological effects could be just, you know, who knows what could happen with this microbial life on Earth. And so, you know, people could go crazy just thinking that there's now aliens among us on Earth. And so um, it could be harmful and, and too powerful to control. That's a good one. So it could be harmful. Yeah, so there's also just the human um, nature here. And like you mentioned, it's, uh, you know, if we, if we bring back um, alien life, uh, people could get potentially too excited and, and maybe greedy and things and try to um, do weird experiments and things. And um, we have to be cautious on how we work with the science. So, so those are some great answers. So um, I'll clear that up now and move in. But you can see why we should care about that, right? But maybe the more important thing about astrobiology isn't looking for um, or talking about Earth-based life, right? The microbes that we send into space or onto other planets, um, that's not exactly what astrobiologists usually study. Typically, we're studying um, naturally occurring microbes. Unfortunately, looking for microbial life is very hard. Um, we saw on the Padlet, and let's maybe go back to the Padlet real quick and see if there's any updates. Yeah, and so we can see on the Padlet, that there's, um, you know, the techniques for finding them. People suggest um, really powerful telescopes, sending samples back to Earth, um, microscopes and thermal imaging and things like this. Unfortunately, micro, uh, microbes are so small the telescopes and, and thermal imaging are pretty much out of the question um, to try to find them directly. And microscopes, um, you know, you're kind of looking for, pardon the expression, but you're kind of looking for a needle in a haystack when it comes to, you know, if you put a microscope on a rover and you just have it kind of scan the ground and everything, it's going to be very hard just to, you know, coincidentally find life. And so while looking for life itself is hard since they're so small, we can look for certain things that can tell us where we should narrow our search for life. And so these are two types of things. We have life enablers, like water, chemicals, and energy. And so any time that we hear about water on another planet um, or anywhere else in the solar system, people get really excited because water is the, it, we know that water can enable life. It's the, the most important life enabler that we know of. Um, but there's also other chemicals. Um, for example, we breathe in oxygen and that's a huge life enabler for us. And there's also just energy. So anytime that we see energy happening or being created, um, energy is, is uh, profoundly important to the development of life. But we can also look for waste outputs of life to know where it might be. These would be things like chemicals or certain types of energy or carbon dioxide, for example. Um, we breathe in oxygen and we let out carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is our unique waste product and other life has that too. And so we can look for those traces of life. And so, um, while we can look for traces of life, here's some examples of us looking for these traces of life, um, whether it be chemicals or otherwise. So th these Mars Viking missions, these are back in um, the 60s or 70s, so 80-ish years ago. Um, and these were two almost identical um, landers that landed on different parts of Mars. And you can see here, they have this uh, long crane looking thing that, pretty much just dug right into the ground. And so when it digs into the ground, um, it's looking for 
signs of life in the soil. Now, these were an older mission. And so, um, unfortunately, we didn't have any profound uh, uh, things discovered by this, right? Otherwise, we'd all have a very different discussion right now. Um, it had mostly inconclusive results, but it did lead to a lot of other um, options. And so we have this Europa Clipper. And um, I want to actually, I'll go here really quickly, but I, I more or less want to post this in the chat. And that's the main thing I want to do. Because this website, this is NASA's website for this um, Europa Clipper mission. And I'll post in the chat in a few minutes here. And um, it has this really cool interactive swipe option where you just kind of swipe through and you learn a little bit about this really impressive moon of Jupiter. It's got a vast ocean, it's got an icy shell, and you know, a little bit here you'll see. And it has some of the right ingredients for life, like I mentioned, water, chemistry, and energy. And so this is a really um, hot topic in astronomy, or astrobiology specifically. And you can even on this website, you can even check out the, the spacecraft that they're planning. Um, and so I won't spend too much more time here, but I, I will post that in the chat because I really encourage everyone to look through um, this webpage to learn about why we're looking on Europa and uh, what we plan to send there, because it's really exciting. Um, but as you can see here, I accidentally revealed the last one, which is a planned um, or proposed Mars mission called the Icebreaker mission, um, which is the Icebreaker mission is uh, very similar to the Viking missions, except it's planning to dig more so into the um, into the polar ice of Mars to look for life there. So I'm not sure if everyone has a pen or paper with them. Um, but if you do, I would love for you guys to spend a minute here um, really briefly maybe and just uh, try to draw in just a minute or two here, just try to draw your best uh, idea for a micro planting robot, right? So we just saw a couple of examples of missions. Um, so how would you go about trying to find microbes? So spend a minute, whether you have pen or paper, or I'm gonna make some divisions up here. And so feel free, you can take a square. I'll uh, enable you guys to write on here in a minute. All right, so everyone should be able to annotate this now. Um, and so you can feel free to try to draw in here um, or on pen and paper if you have it. Um, and just spend a minute or two. Um, and if you guys don't finish your drawings in that time, that's okay. Um, and that, after that time though, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what you guys drew.
All right, and these are looking awesome. Um, go ahead and continue for just another uh, minute here. If anyone's um, doing it on pen and paper, I would encourage you guys to um, turn on your, your video for a moment and um, hold it up for us so we can all see. Um, and then after we see everyone who made one, um, we'll go ahead and uh, move on to our next slide here and, and talk about some real life micro hunting robots. I drew one too, so I'll share mine real quick. Um, I might have to turn off my, my background. I'm not actually sure I turned off, so you might not be able to see it, but here's mine. If you can. Yeah, they're really hard to get to focus in here. I like yours a lot. That one's great. There's, there's ours. Yeah, these are great. I love um you look like it's got like control panels and everything and some stands. Um and we can see some of us are prioritizing different things. I've got a little crane here. Um, looks like we've got wheels and we've got legs and everything. So this is great. Um, all right, so I'll go ahead and stop us here. If anyone else has one that they drew on paper, um, I would love to see them. So please, um, in the next minute uh, here, hold them up and show everyone. All right, this is great. So um, I see three awesome, unique ones up here. Um, one on pen and paper and then two more on the board. So this is great. Uh, please everyone uh, keep these. If, if you just did it on the pen, if you just did it on the whiteboard, uh, feel free to take a screenshot. Um, and I'll move on to our next slide here. And um, I'm trying to click once here, and so you still have a moment to take a screenshot here. But so we can see that we all had different ideas here, um, but there's some common features, right? Like mobility, they all have to be able to move. Um, they all have certain types of vision tools, right? Like eyes or whatever. And so these are really good um, examples of what we're looking for. And so here's an example of some of the research I'm doing right now. Um, and uh, I'll leave these drawings up for just another minute here. But um, so the NASA Braille project, which I'm a part of this summer, has uh, is working with these Boston Dynamics spot robots to try to look for microbial life on Earth. Um, they're doing it right now on Earth, but the goal would be eventually to send it to space. So. Let's move into our next one. I'll just do that real quick. And then here is just a really quick, um, I won't play this whole thing, but here's a quick idea on what these robots can do. Um, and so, I hope everyone can hear the sound, but it's a music video that they uh, use these robots, they program these robots to dance to. So these are really powerful robots. They can do all sorts of really unique things, um, including this really awesome dancing um, skit here. Yes, right, they can dance. Um, it's great, so. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, all right. So they've pretty much finished their their whole dance here. Um, 
so I'll interrupt the routine just in the in the uh, in the effort of conserving time here. But you can see how powerful these the mobility and um, and utility of these robots can be. So really quickly, um, Braille, which stands for everything in NASA has these really long acronyms. So it stands for biological and resource analog investigations in low light environments. And um, I get winded saying it. So I'm imagining that people don't quite get what that means the first time around. Um, but really all it means is that we're looking for signs of life in dark places. Uh, specifically, we're looking in caves. So you can see here are the spot robots that Braille is using. So some of them have different tools. So you can see this one here has this uh, long arm with a special um, light uh, that comes off. This one here has uh, some automated equipment on the back as well as a, a bright light to move around with. And this one up here has some really heavy duty automated and mapping equipment. So this is a cave in Northern California in, in America. And um, again, it's, it's an analog, some of the caves that we expect to find on Mars. So turning these, this is a quick animation I made, but so we take these spot robots and we're gonna try to plop them onto Mars. And the goal of that is um, once we have them on Mars and they're up and running there, then they can be looking for life there. And with any luck, they'll get really excited and they'll find microbes. Um, so that's all I've got for everyone here. Um, I love to, to see the, those three drawings. Those were fantastic. So um, uh, please, if anyone wants to continue and, and work on you know, uh, more drawings or, or continued drawing, um, and share it with Julia later. I would love to see them, so please feel free. Um, but just as a quick recap of some of the stuff we talked about, we can potentially find microbes all over the solar system, even in places that we've contaminated with them, like in the ISS, the International Space Station. And it's important to try to con uh, control this contamination. Uh, like someone mentioned, we really don't want to find life and get really excited and realize it's something that we accidentally put there. Um, finding microbes is hard, but we can use, uh, we can find signs of them instead to narrow our search. And there's a growing interest in some really cool microbe hunting missions, including these spot robots. And as we can see, they're great for looking for life, but they're also really cool dancers. So um, I'll leave everyone with just a, a quick side note question, really quick. Uh, 630, um, June 30th was um, the National Ashray Day here in America. And so we made this little animated spot robot jumping on an asteroid. So do you get, do you guys think that um, the, the spot robot would fly into space or do you think it would fall back down? Um, you don't have to answer that yet. Um, and we are gonna go ahead and I'll stop my screen, my share, and we'll take a quick break. Um, before Maddie comes in and, and talks to you guys all about a very cool type of um, microbe. But, all right, so we'll take um, just a few minutes here and then Maddie can start when she's ready. So yeah, just... yeah, so if you guys want to take a three or four minute break, so we'll come back at 11.38 and I will give my presentation.
guys. Like cool. By then, will be too. Just a quick. Guys, what? But it's an astral. If you explain, then at the end. Um, and quick feel. Um, Mighty, we cannot hear you well, unfortunately. You may need to move to a place with a with a better internet connection. Anybody? Um, not really. Uh, my headphones. Oh, yeah, you try them. Is it okay? A lab, so um, let me try. We're only hearing kind of select words, it seems, right now. We can take a three minute break and uh, go stretch and rest and then come back. Let's do that.
Okay, hi guys. Uh, after this break, we can talk about my homework experiment uh, until Medic came. I can share. Oh, Medic came. Hi, Medi. Still, your voice is not clear. Okay, in this time, I will share my screen and talk about that experiment a little bit. Here, uh, we will make our own colony with uh, microorganisms. And you need some bottle and scissors and some colorful pens. Uh, I will send, uh, I, I have sent a link to you so you can check all the um, materials and ingredients. And to prepare this, uh, you need to cut off the plastic bottle uh, and you need to ask any help from uh, an adult. And then you need to draw a short lines, um, a, quart uh, a quarter from the bottom and also the top. And then uh, you need to dig up uh, from a pond or a rain puddle or riverbed uh, to get uh, microbes. And you need to remove the rocks and uh, other solid matters, matters. And also you need to be careful about uh, broken glasses. And also you need to collect a, a water from mud source or tap water you can use. And then this is the um, hard part. You need to cut a sheet of newspaper in thin uh, strips, and then uh, you need to make them uh, tiny um, rectangles. And then uh, this will provide a carbon uh, resource. And you need a hard boiled egg. Uh, you will use the yolk, for, uh, yolk of it. And this will be a, a sulfur. A resource for them and you need to mix them add the water and mix and then uh, you will continue with this part you will take those uh, to other uh, bottles plastic bottles and add and spin and um, then you will have something like that when you wait uh, eight or ten weeks and for the layers and checking them, you can use this uh, picture in the link and you can check what they are, why they are, their color is like that. I hope you can do it. And now I will stop my share. I hope Medi can continue with his uh, her presentation. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, clearly. OK. That's yes, very good. All right, so I just logged into the audio on my phone. Um, so I will share my screen on my laptop and I'll be talking through my phone. Uh, hopefully this will work. So sorry for the inconvenience. This has not happened before, but um, all right. So very quickly. Um, so yeah, start, start off for a quick icebreaker. If you guys wanna say in the chat what your favorite organism is that isn't an animal. So this could be a plant, a bacteria, I really like tardigrades, so it could be that. Um, but yeah, this is going to be an outline of my talk. Um, first off, a little bit about me. I'm from the US. I've lived in a couple states. I'm very passionate about biology and earth sciences, um, which is why I'm interested in astrobiology. I'm currently a biology major in college, uh, and I have a pet rabbit, which is very cool, and I like playing guitar. Um, I've been very lucky to participate in a few astrobiology experiments uh, through the years. The first one I was able to do in high school, which is kind of what started my interest in this pre uh, topic I'm gonna be discussing, which is how do lichens survive uh, Martian UV radiation? Um, and we'll go over that question later in this talk, so I won't spoil it. But um, in the top, you can see pictures, one picture of a lichen and a picture from the Atacama Desert, which is the driest place on earth pretty much. Um, and I was able to get samples from there, which is very cool. Uh, the two other experiments I've been looking at was the basically the origin of life and how it uses different bacteria uh, metabolisms over time and how we can use this to look at origin of life. And that's also what I'm doing over the summer with the youth science program at uh, Blue Marble. Uh, three ways, if you guys are interested in getting into research, that's really where the 
um, next step for you is going to be if you are interested and you're learning about astrobiology, it will be um, implementing what you've learned. So for me, I think the best ways getting involved would be through schoolwork. Make sure you take lab courses and science classes uh, over the summer, like what you're doing now. You can go to specialized camps or uh, sign up for uh, research programs, uh, or you could start a club or join a club. I know, I think NASA has a few youth programs that you could also look into. Um, and I think just you guys already interested at such a young age is an advantage and there's really cool opportunities um, that you could go ahead and start thinking about experimenting for. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and go into um, what I would call big extremophiles, which would be lichens and fungi um, and why I think they're special. Um, well, first off, what do you guys think uh, an extremophile is? Uh, you can write this in the chat or you can just kind of think about it. This is definitely a word you have heard a lot, I'm sure, in these presentations, so I don't want to hammer down the point. Um, but they are pretty cool and they are a cornerstone of thinking about what life could be like in um, other planets. Just, um, well, so just to review, uh, an organism, um, yeah, so an extreme file is just an organism that grows in conditions or locations that would be hard for other life forms to exist in. And these conditions could be anything related to temperature, radiation, pressure, salinity, acidity, a bunch of different stuff. Um, and you are probably familiar with a few bacteria like this before and like tardigrades specifically. And um, they're very cool. But the one thing all of these organisms have in common is that they are microscopic. So we need a microscope to be able to see them. And that's what a microbe is, right? But um, this is where I think lichens are special because they are a totally different type of life form to other extremophiles. Um, so if we wanna think about, uh, I'm not sure if you guys, how familiar you are with this, but there are two big classes of life. There are prokaryotes and then there are eukaryotes. Um, most microbes are bacteria, archaea are prokaryotes and most plants and animals are eukaryotes as well as uh, lichen. And uh, the three major differences between them would be their DNA, uh, their cellular parts and their size. Um, and you don't need to necessarily keep that in mind, but the key thing here is that when I talk about uh, eukaryotes extremophiles, that means they are at a higher complexity of order in life um, and are still able to survive in these harsh conditions, um, which is pretty incredible. Um, so, that leads into the question of what is a lichen, right? Um, you may not be familiar with the term, but I guarantee you've seen a lichen before. Uh, for example, this picture is not a lichen. This is moss. Uh, they're often very confused with one another um, because they both grow on trees and grow in similar places and they're both often green. Um, but before I tell you what a lichen is, I'm gonna go over what a lichen is not. Uh, first off, a lichen is not a plant. Uh, whereas a moss is a plant. Uh, they are non-flowering, so you won't see any like roses or daisies, um, but they have uh, no stems. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, they have uh, no stem or root system, whereas mosses do. They're also um, not a parasite. Can you guys see my screen okay? We might be on a different slide than you. It looks like um, we're still on the pro and UK oh. slide. Yeah, can you guys I see it now? Yeah, yeah, Much no, better. we can see. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so a lichen is not a non flowering plant, and uh, it's also not a parasite. So, parasitism is when it affects a host, um, and lichens are usually on a host and just for growing, they don't use it for um, nutrients. So they don't infect without asking or treating, which is what we consider viruses to do. Um, so again, let's go into what a lichen is. So uh, can you guys see the screen? Okay. Um, a lichen is made up of two microbes that you've learned about with Zainab, uh, algae and a fungi. Um, and together they're in a mutually beneficial relationship. So the algae or the bacteria component often called the photobiont um, trade energy uh, 
usually photosynthesis with the fungi or the mycobiont in a mutually beneficial relationship. Um, they also, in the fungi in return, give protection to the algae so they're able to live in places they couldn't otherwise. Um, and this is why they are able, um, may be considered extremophiles because uh, hardy lichens, uh, well, first off, lichens are found in basically every major ecosystem on earth. So that means they're found in the Arctic, they're found in deserts, they're found in mountains, they're found in forests, uh, they're found everywhere, even in the ocean. So, and they come in a bunch of different shapes and sizes. Um, and they're able to survive in super harsh conditions like extremophiles. So they can do drastic high temperatures, low temperatures, pressures, radiation. And um, like extremophiles, they also often have slow growth. They um, are smaller in size and they um, can um, live in these environments, right? Um, and one of the few ways they do this is through pigmentation. So you can see on the images on the slide here that they often have bright floral colors. And um, this is kind of acting as a sunscreen against any radiation damage for them. So they do have a purpose besides being really pretty. And uh, you also have a trait in lichens for hibernation. This is kind of an evolved state where if they're exposed to any harsh conditioning, they can just kind of go to sleep and wake up when the um, harsh condition is gone. Um, for example, there's a study where lichens were put in liquid nitrogen for 10 years and then they came out and they were perfectly fine. They just slept for 10 years. Um, so I wish humans would learn how to do that. Um, but the last thing is their symbiosis. So as I described on the last slide, um, they, the fungal unit usually kind of wraps around the algae cells like a security blanket and that keeps it secure from any of these harsh conditions like temperatures that the algae cell would be more sensitive to um, without the lichen. Um, and so that's how this relationship generally works. Um, and an interesting fact, if you guys have heard the word uh, symbiosis before, that was originally created to describe uh, a lichen. Um, the lichen came up with the term um, in general. And there has been some debate on if this is a mutually beneficial relationship or if it is a parasite. Um, some think the fungi may be stealing food from the algae, um, but that's not true for all of them, if it may be true for a lot. Um, but yeah, if you guys are specifically like to learn more about lichens, um, not necessarily related to astrobiology, um, you guys can uh, check out this link here. Uh, it's just bit.ly. Dot L -Y -Y -S -P underscore lichenology. This is another presentation I've done with lichens and this just gives you a more overview on the general biology, not related to astrobiology, but still could be pretty neat. Um, so yeah, now I will go over everything, but in space. So I've gone over how lichens can be considered extremophiles and how they are non-microscopic eukaryotic extremophiles. But what does that mean for astrobiologists? Um, well, one way we can look at them is um, how Ryan brought up uh, contamination and how this is an important issue for colonization. Um, we do see fungi as well on top of bacteria can survive in harsh um, conditions past sterilization. So there's two molds found on the ISS, um, Aspergillus and Penicillin, which are pretty common molds. Um, and astronauts there tested them for um, radiation and uh, just to give you context on the doses they picked, a dose of 0.7 gray, which is just the unit of measurement for radiation, uh, that would be the exposure you get for a trip to Mars. Um, the radiation dose of 0.5 would give you radiation sickness and a dose of five would, would mean death essentially. But these fungi survive upwards of a thousand doses of this. So they're pretty hardy. So it's very likely if we um, just had one growing on a rover, it would at least survive to go to Mars, whether or not it would grow or not is left to be said. But yeah, so these guys are pretty um, survivable. Uh, that brings me to the important question of how do we measure survival? How can we prove that something did um, live in a place or it could live in a place? Um, if you guys have any ideas for that, uh, you can put it in the chat. There, um, yeah, so by generations. So there's three main ways uh, scientists can do it. 
Um, one is through viability, like either cell viability or just organism viability. So did it live or not? So just the basic question, right? Um, and you can do this through uh, cell staining. So um, you can stain something green and that means it's alive. And if it's red, it means it's um, dead. So that's an often way to tell how an organism um, tolerated any condition you're measuring. You can also look at growth. So it's one question to say, did it survive a condition, but did it thrive in it? Was it able to go undergo normal function? Uh, that's an important question if we're thinking about other life on other planets. Like for example, it's one thing to say a lichen could survive there, but would it long-term be there? And the same kind of thought goes into reproduc reproduction, right? Like, would it only be there for five years? Would it be able to live there a hundred years, a thousand years? Um, how long of generations would we see? Um, another example of uh, fungi in space would be uh, the black fungi cryomyces. They are one of the hardiest organisms on Earth. They live in Antarctica and survive, which is the most uh, similar environment we have on Earth to Mars. Um, and they are also considered cryoendolithic organisms, which means they live inside rocks or in the subsurface, and this is to help protect from any of the surface conditions. Um, the uh, these fungi were exposed to Mars and space conditions. Um, and what was found at the end of this study was that they were still able to produce, not normally, and it was severely impaired, but the ability was not totally gone for a lot of these fungi, which brings up the question of if they were put in like on Mars or in space conditions over time, would we end up getting colonies that were more resistant or even more extreme? Uh, and how, like, so ideas of a lot more long-term experimentation for this would be really exciting to see. Uh, finally, here are, there are a few examples of lichen in space. Um, lichens have probably been uh, in space more than you have, well, for sure, more than you have, I'm sure, but um, they've gone to a lot of different ISS experiments. Um, two of my favorites uh, would be Xanthoria elegans. This is my favorite lichen just because of its beautiful coloring. Um, it's also called the sunburst lichen. Um, it was in a long exposure trip um, to Mars conditions in low orbit on space, like on the ISS. Um, and it was found that it was mostly viable after this exposure, so it was able to survive it. Um, but we saw the thing where it went into this hibernation state, right? So it was living afterwards, but it was not doing its normal, like, cell uh, lichen life during exposure to these conditions. So it just kind of shut down and waited for it to be over. And we see the same thing happening with uh, the other lichen, Circanaria gyrosa. This is a really funky looking one, um, but they're all kind of weird looking. Um, and this one was also exposed to Mars and space conditions for 18 months. And we saw a rapid recovery of normal function after exposure. Um, but the same thing, it wasn't really doing anything while it was being exposed. Um, and interestingly, we also saw damage to its DNA after the experiments, um, which shows that maybe even longer term, it could end up killing the lichen if we had, if we kept testing it after 18 months. Um, so that leads to the big ticket question that um, I'm sure you all are wondering is, could lichens survive on Mars? Um, there's a few things to keep in mind when we're asking this question. The first uh, being uh, the environment of Mars. So temperatures there fluctuate wildly, much more than they do on Earth. We have a much weaker magnetic sphere and atmospheres. Um, so there's gonna be more radiation and the atmosphere is almost totally different in composition. We have carbon dioxide as opposed to our nitrogen and oxygen atmosphere. Uh, we also have must, much less uh, liquid water than what we'd find on Earth, even if it is there. Um, and it's also there frozen, I guess. Uh, and then in terms of the limitations of lichens is, again, would they actually be able to like live there? Would they grow? Could the algae like even make nutrients, right? Because the soil there is very different and they don't have a lot of the chemicals they need for simple biology. Um, but astrobiologists thinking about this question have come up with a few characteristics that a putative Martian lichen, so if we were gonna to go to Mars and we were going to find a lichen, these are the characteristics that we would think it must have to survive. So one would probably be um, being endolithic. So it would have to live underground or in a rock to survive um, just to protect from the radiation. 
Um, it would probably be slow growing. A lot of lichens are slow growing just because of where they live. There's one in Antarctica that's over 5,000 years old. Um, so it's most likely if we were to find one there, it'd probably be very, very old. They're often probably go through cycles of hibernation and dehydration based on when there is flowing water. Um, and they probably have a heavy or a dark pigment like the black fungus or the very orange lichen just to protect from the radiation. And interestingly, uh, there is sometimes lichens that will associate with bacteria, which can fix nit nitrogen. And if we were to study these types of lichens, it's possible that they would be able to get the nutrients they need to run a lot of the photosynthesis and respiration that life long term would need to survive. Um, so that would be also an interesting question. Um, yeah, okay. So seems like we're a little bit over time. I have um, another part of this presentation, um, but if you have to go, um, I completely understand you're free to do so. But if you would like to participate in our um, activity, a uh, quick experiment, you can go ahead. Um, real quick before you guys leave, I'm going to share with you a fun activity I made um, for you to take home. So if you guys are interested in learning about um, more lichens, where you can find lichens on earth, um, first, let me, I'm gonna put the link in the chat. So if you want to, <laughs> I'm glad you find it interesting. Um, well, so, let me go over this first. So if we want to go to this link, you will find a Padlet. Um, and on this Padlet, um, you will see a PDF called Lichen Field Guide. So I made this for you all to print out or look over on your own time and essentially gives you instructions to go outside and look for lichens and um, explore them in their natural habitat, which is earth. Um, and you can answer a few questions. Um, so yeah, I think this would be fun for y'all. They're very cool. Um, and then next time you're out with friends, you can just point to a tree and say, that's what a lichen is. Um, and then at the end, you can upload any pictures, cool things you saw to this Padlet. Um, and yeah, so that's something you can do on your own time. And if you just remember this link, you should be able to get there. Um, now I will go over the next part of this experiment, uh, next part of this talk, where I'm going to go over how you guys can think about designing your own experiment. Um, so I'm sure some of you guys are familiar with the scientific method, um, if you've learned it in class, um, and it never goes away, I promise. If you pursue science further, you will always be considering the scientific method. So um, what you guys have been doing, um, mostly through these talks, has been observing. You've been learning about different topics, and you've probably been asking questions too, right? So you've had uh, many great ideas. And so the key um, step, next step for being a scientist is turning these ideas into answerable um, statements. So this is what would be... Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's a pretty big file, um, but um, you guys are able to come up with a hypothesis for any of the questions you have, then you're set to become a scientist and to design experiments for this. So one of the ways you would do this is you come up with variables and measurements um, and you design an experiment and run it, then you get conclusions and decide what happened um, and the cycle continues forever, <laughs> uh, essentially, because we're never done with science. But I'm gonna give you guys a chance today to come up with your own experimental design. So up on the screen, I have uh, the layout I really enjoy using when I am designing experiments. It looks a little complicated at first glance, but we're gonna go through it step-by-step. Step. Um, so, and you don't have to copy any of this down right now, but um, for thinking about an experiment, um, first off, it's good to draw just a square box. Um, no lines in the middle yet. And then first off, we want to think about our independent variables, or that's the thing that we are changing in a, an experiment. So in this example here, I am seeing what's the difference between a green lichen and an orange lichen. So the variable I'm changing here is the color of the lichen. So I have two top boxes. 
Um, and on the side of the box, I have the thing I'm measuring, which would be the dependent variable. So my question here is how would a green lichen and how would an orange lichen differ in their response to radiation? So in the side, I have my measure of with radiation and without radiation. Um, and at the bottom, I put the constant. So for this experiment, I want the temperature to be the same. I want the pressure to be the same. Um, I want everything but the things in the box to be the same. Um, and in the middle, you can also put how many times you're going to repeat this experiment or how many lichens you're going to look at from this green lichen. Um, and then it's important just somewhere on the side to keep track of what are you going to write down when you run this experiment? Like what data are you going to record? Um, this is how you have proof of any pattern you see, right? Um, so this goes back to the question I asked at the beginning where it's um, how do you measure survival? Um, in this case, you could look at viability. So what is still alive at the end? Um, and you can also look at size. So what continued to grow in this experiment? Um, so now if you guys would like, give you a chance to design your own experiment. You can um, do this on a sheet of paper. You can do this on like a Word document. You could just think about it or follow along with me. Um, this is just a good exercise for you guys. Um, so in the future, when you come up with experiments, think of it as a thought exercise to design an experiment. And once you do that enough, it'll become very second nature to you. And there'll be uh, just a good way to um, engage with science in the future. So. First stop is if you wanna come up with a question, uh, this could be a question you have from anything we've talked about today in the past, um, or it can be an example I have in the slide. I would just recommend it's something very as specific as possible. So we don't want our question to be, does life exist in the universe, right? Because there's just so many different ways you can interpret that or measure that. It's just too big of a question to put in an experiment on its own. Um, so my example question here is, would lichens survive radiation on Europa? Which is an interesting question as Europa is also a key target for astrobiologists for life there. Um, so though that, so if you guys come up with a question, the next thing to do would be to predict what will happen. And this would be your hypothesis. Not all experiments need to have a hypothesis, but it gives you a good idea to see if this experiment is realistic enough to test. Like if you don't know enough to predict, maybe you need to think of a smaller question, right? Um, at least for this, since I know a decent amount of Europa, I'm gonna say, um, lichens could survive radiation depending on where they are on Europa, right? So on the surface, they may not do very well, but we know that there's also an underground ocean on Europa. So maybe they could live there um, better than we could. So next step would be uh, to design. If you come up with a question and maybe come up with a hypothesis. Um, so first step would be drawing a box. This can just be a flat square box. Um, and you wanna write at the top the thing you are changing, right? So in this example experiment, I am changing, well, I wanna look at different lichens or different fungi as well. So I'm gonna pick the three that we talked about today. I'm looking at Z. elegans, uh, Cryomyces, which is the black fungi, um, and then uh, Circinaria gyrosa. Um, and the, again, this is just anything you're changing. It doesn't have to be uh, different species. This is, since I'm looking at different species, that's the thing that's being changed. Um, and then on the side, the thing I'm measuring is, well, I want to measure um, how the radiation levels, different radiation levels affect these different organisms. So I'm going to look at the radiation at um, the ocean level of Europa, the ice layer of Europa, and the surface layer of Europa. Um, and that I will measure the responses of these different organisms to each radiation level. And then at the bottom, you write what stays the same. So here again, I want to keep any other environmental condition uh, the same. So even though Europa probably has colder temperatures, different pressures and different nutrients, that's not what my question is asking, right? It's just asking if it could survive the radiation levels. So that's just gonna stay the same for all of my experiments. Um, and then lastly, I wanna write down what I'm recording. So I will probably with this record at the end, how many cells or how many organisms are just still alive. Um, this is pretty general uh, measurement. Um, yeah, so that's the experiment I came up with. Um, if you, if you guys want to take one or two minutes or more time, you can think of your own experiment or you can share it. Um, but if you can't think of anything, you're welcome to, um, just ask questions as well.
while we're doing that, I actually might um, show a quick video. So you guys think, keep thinking about your experiment. Um, oh yeah, here's also the field guide. I'm gonna show it without sound because the topic, um, but I'll just have subtitles. This is just a cool video about a paper on lichens. And it's got really pretty lichens on it. It seems like it's going very slow, so. <laughs> but yeah, this is a cool paper. Um, essentially what it's talking about actually is that lichens aren't always just an algae and a fungi. Sometimes they have another fungi and sometimes they have a bacteria. Um, so there's always an exception that proves the rule, right? Um, yeah, so if there anyone that has a question or thought they came up with an experiment that they'd like to share, Cool, all right, you can go ahead and uh, talk about it if you'd like. All right, thank you. Um, I wasn't able to finish the entire design experiment, but I do have a question. Um, so my question is, if we like cut a piece of the lichen off, would it regenerate itself or would it just stay as two separate organisms? Or what would happen if you basically like cut it that's and, a good oh yeah go ahead <laughs> well the thing that I'd probably change or do to the organism is remove a piece of it and then the thing to measure is would it stay alive or would it go into its hibernation state not sure and then what stays the same is the amount of lichens that I will use so it's not drastically changed and that's so far what I came up with. That's a really good experiment. Um, yeah, I think that's a cool question. Um, and I, I can give you an answer to it, um, but it's cool that you came up with it independently. Um, so yeah, if we were gonna cut just like a little piece off a of lichen, um, it would still probably grow um, as a single organism, but there is a way to isolate the two components um, and have them grow separately. Um, in a lab setting, they don't survive if you do that in the environment. Um, and there are actually astrobiology experiments that will separate them and then test the separate um, units also did the same conditions. And that's where we do find as well that they don't survive as well apart. But um, that is a really cool design. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> is there anyone else? If not, uh, it is a hard question. So there's no pressure if you didn't come up with something. But Again, this is just a good framework to think of when you're moving forward with uh, science. Okay, if that's um, all, um, I can go ahead and say thank you. I have this cute little cartoon. Uh, <laughs> and then if there are any final questions, both for me or but for Ryan and Zainab Bye, as well. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you for for uh, hanging out with us. Thank you, guys. Uh, bye, bye bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It was bye. wonderful. Thank you. Good job. Bye, guys. Yeah, good job. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> Great. Thank you. No problem. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll. Uh, talk to you on monday absolutely yeah yes. see you on monday write, bye -bye. write it all down and yeah <laughs> well yeah. still fresh right? all right thank you guys bye bye, -bye.